Hello, my name is Kelvin Garvan, and welcome to Downbeat TV. I'm pleased to be your host for this segment of Downbeat TV's interview. Washington, D.C. is an international capital. It is filled with well-renowned uh, cultural institutions and a rich mosaic of brilliant, vibrant artists. Downbeat TV is delighted to have two of those artists in the studio today for the hour. We'll be talking to them about their work, their past projects, their future projects, and how they manifest their vision through their work. Let us begin with Hubert Jackson. Hubert Jackson's paintings are inspired by the ever-changing, undulating, and unpredictable qualities of nature. His paintings feature highly textured, multicolored planes in an attempt to capture these unending variances. Mr. Jackson uses hard edges and angles to represent man-made structures and their coexistence with nature. He attempts to capture a feeling of spirituality and energy and a way to express them that leaves a positive and lasting impression. Mr. Jackson was born in Culpeper, Virginia. He earned his bachelor's degree in fine arts education at Virginia State University in 1965 and a master's degree in painting from Howard University in 1971. In 1999, Mr. Jackson retired from 34 years of teaching art in the Washington, D.C. public schools and settled in Colonial Beach, Virginia, where he now does his work. Carolyn Sharon Goodridge, born in Port-au-Prince, Spain, Trinidad and Tobago. She immigrated with her family to New York City at the age of two and began developing skills in music and art and interests in spiritual philosophies before the age of 12. After graduating high school, she became a resident at the Cho Gi Ye International Zen Center, a Korean Zen temple in Manhattan. She went on to leave New York, study art at the University of Florida, Gainesville, and received an MFA from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She is inspired by many artists that include Mark Rothko, Clifford Still, Hans Hoffman, Kandinsky, Paul Clay, Mark Toby, John Cage, Richard Serra, and Ravi Shankar. She says she's inspired by life, music, and color. In the process of painting, I discover that spontaneity is a window to authenticity. I find joy and reverence in visceral energy, like the sun, wind, rain, and earth. She asks us to imagine the forces of nature in the act of creating life and says, I want to capture the wonder of our universe, its radiance and intelligence in my paintings, and I do it with drama and emotion. Therefore, encaustic, the use of pigment and beeswax, is a perfect choice and is a fitting medium created by nature herself. She's not only an artist, but she's an art entrepreneur. She's the catalyst and curator for Art Impact USA, an organization dedicated to creating synergistic relationships between artists, nonprofits, and corporations in order to establish opportunities for artists to exhibit while increasing public awareness of and funds for local nonprofit organizations. We're delighted to have them and delighted to find out more about who they are and how what they do changes our lives. Thank you and welcome. I'm curious about Art Impact USA. It seems that this is debunking the notion of the starving artist. Can you tell us and the studio audience more about that? Yes, Art Impact USA really is an arts initiative dedicated to artists. I'm an artist, but I'm also looking out for the up and coming artists who really don't know how to navigate the art market. I'm very good with marketing, so I want to help them show their light. And I use Art Impact USA as a vehicle to present other artists to the community via nonprofit organizations who always need artists to help them do fundraisers and so forth, and also corporations who want more visibility in the community. So I do a lot of networking. I go and speak with a lot of people and I get them interested in the artists. So I feel in a sense like a leader in the art world for the artists in the young artists in the DC area because they they don't know how to navigate. Not all of them, some of them. So they come to me and I set up these 
exhibits. One was Pepco exhibit, and this the the Pepco Edison Place Gallery owned by Pepco Holdings. They actually grant space to artists. Not all the artists really understand that. So with the help of Hubert Jackson, who knew about this before, he said, Carolyn, call them up. So I did. I called them up and I said, how can we have a show in there? And they told me what I needed to do. They said, we need to have a nonprofit organization come in and lead this. So I was a member of the Black Artists of D.C. So I said, well, I called Black Artists of D.C. They said, we would love to lead this. So that's how we joined. And that's really the heart and the spirit of Art Impact USA. I want to make an impact not just for the nonprofits, but also for the artists. Not just for the artists, but also for the community, and not only just for the community, but also for the corporations. So the Nard Impact could be considered a bridge between the creative vision and the entrepreneurial spirit of the artist. Exactly. Exactly, because each artist truly is an entrepreneur. They may not know it, but they really are. The pieces that you brought today, Mr. Jackson, are quite colorful and imaginative and energetic, as your bio explained. In terms of bridging the gap with people, individuals who might purchase these items for their homes and corporations that might actually own them, like a Pepco, did you see or do you see the possibility of that type of opportunity through Art Impact? I do. And I, uh, first of all, let me say that um, <clears throat> this experience with Pepco uh, was very, very uh, lucrative for me in a number of ways. Uh, not only did I uh, actually sell paintings uh, and to some um, uh, very well-connected people, but I got to meet a lot of uh, people who were very um, um, not known in the art world and very n known in the D.C. area uh, and just connecting with them and some of the artists that were brought in who were uh, at a very high level of accomplishment uh, helped me. So, yeah, that art impact um, that Carolyn has um, has talked about is a very um, is very up and coming um, uh, force in the D.C. area. Mm. Now I want to make sure I don't lose sight of that date. This event occurred this past February. That's right. It was it was the Black History Month in February 2015, and it was the Light of the Ancestors exhibition. Now you're going to have another exhibition that is going to be with PEPCO, in yes. conjunction with PEPCO, yes. and that's going to be this coming year, 2016. Yes. And when is that going to be? In August, the month of August. Now, I did some research and I found that you were also doing some things in the D.C. area, DuPont Circle community, uh, Art Rave. Yes. Tell me more about that. Well, through one of the artists in the Black Artists of D.C., um, Gamillion is his name, and he worked with a gentleman by the name of Ken David. And he said, Carolyn, I've got a job for you. I'm going to introduce you to Ken David. So that's how I got involved with the Art Rave DC, which is also an indoor venue at, I believe it's uh, on Florida Avenue, right off 6th, 7th Street. And so we sort of remodeled some of the space in there, and now it's beautiful, and, and I can invite artists. And we, we have had a first show. It was called the Funk Parade, the Funk Parade Art mm. Expo. It, was, it started the day of the Funk Parade, which I believe was the second annual Funk Parade for DC. So that was very interesting. So that show was still up. And that's going to be through May 26th. So people can go and see that. But DuPont, that's the outdoor venue now. That's going to get started on the 23rd, the first Saturday, um, that it's going to be open. The and 23rd of May. Of May, yes. Okay. And it's going to run all the way down into, I believe, the 19th of December. So every Saturday in a DuPont area, there's, is, I believe it's on... Like 15th and P, I 15th believe. 15th and P, that's right, 15th and P. And it's an, it's an outdoor market, if you will, of artists. So um, come and see. It's going to be fantastic. I'm a late riser. What time is this going to all happen? From 11 until 5 p.m. Are you looking for artists to become part of the art rave by way of art impact? How would someone who wants to be there 
a booth? Uh, how did they go about doing that? Well, I have set up a portal, if you will. It's um, on the artimpactusa.com website. And if they go to events, they'll see the event for DuPont. So it's very easy to find. I tell them the whole story. I show them video that I took of the area. It's a very, very prestigious type of area in DuPont. It's right across the street from the Whole Foods Market. The I think the, there's, there's so many places around there. But it's supposed to be um, at the corner of PN 15th, and we're looking for a, about 30 artists, artisans. They, they don't have to just be visual artists. They can also be, there was also a musician there last time, so. I'm curious, this synergy, and I think that that's probably the best word to, to describe what goes on with the artists that are part of or who augment what members of Art Impact do. For your last exhibit, Light of the Ancestors, you had very well-known Faith Ringgold and Paul Goodnight with some of these emerging artists. Now, do you choose them or do they choose you in terms of how they get to be part of this magnificent event? That's a great question. Um, actually, Faith Ringgold, who I met her for the first time when I was an undergrad in, in the University of Florida, and I never forgot her. So I chose her to be in this show. Hubert actually had taken a picture with her not too long ago, and he said, Carolyn, call Faith Ringgold. And I did. And so she agreed. Mm -hmm. And we had to treat her special because she's very special, gave her special treatment. And, uh, and she did. She showed two quilts, and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. it, really helped, it really helped bring up our whole exhibit. Now, Larry Pancho Brown, he chose me because some of his friends were in the show. And he sort of came in late, and he called me, and he beseeched, Carolyn, please let me in this show. Mm. I said, oh, man. I, I, so we went back and forth for about a week. And finally, I figured out a way to get him in and not to anger the other artists who, who I didn't let in the show. <laughs> but he begged, and it's like, OK. And, and he's a very, very excellent artist. So I felt, OK, you know, we'll see. And it worked out. It worked well, out. well, it seems like you two inspire and conspire in terms of one calling the other and saying, let's use our imagination like we do in our art yes. and find a way to create a bridge between what we're trying to manifest as artists and what we're trying to manifest in terms of the revenue from our art. Yes. Which asks the question, in my mind, using this medium that we have here, growing up, bees are something you stayed away from. <laughs> so let's go through this Barney style. How do you actually go about getting the beeswax to begin the process of creating art like this? And how do you color it? How do you manage the coloring did you use? Is that gesso? Is that oil? Is that watercolor? I really want to know more about this. Very good. I actually, most of the beeswax that I purchase, I purchase online. And, but there was a couple of times where I went to a beekeeper in Fredericksburg and I purchased some beeswax from her. But they usually don't have as much as I need and that's why I go online and just, you know, Google beeswax for sale. So most of the wax I get is from the internet and then I mix my own wax. There's something called, I guess it's um, the, the blocks encaustic blocks and you can purchase them already mixed the colors already mixed for you but they're quite expensive a small piece like that might be $25 of a beautiful blue so I learned very quickly how to make my own paints so I actually purchased powder pigment and mix that with the melted wax and you stir it up just like it would cocoa right and so for each color I have a tin cup on a hot plate. You know those griddles that you make pancakes yes. on? Yes. Those. I, I use that and so I have a big one and I have maybe six or seven tin cups that's melted and then I can take a brush and use it just like regular paint but it has to be melted. I can't, you, you can't paint with the hardened wax so it has to be melted. So I'm from Trinidad and I love the heat so that's fine. It's like cooking. So I, and I usually use wood to paint on. 
So this is on wood. And when I, when I put one color, in order for another color to fuse with it, you have to melt it again. So you have to melt the whole thing again to fuse the colors together. So the art is controlling the force of the heat gun. It's almost like you're painting with air. So it's very exciting and I love it and I've been doing this over 10 years now so even though it can look very spontaneous it does take some good control and I've taught this many times and so so the artists usually they're artists who already know how to draw and paint and so forth and they come to my classes so I don't teach them the basics I teach them how to go beyond their their uh, artistry as it if you will. Uh, Hubert in terms of how you mix various types of media as well as objects. Before we began the program, I was asking you about what you use to actually, in this particular painting to, uh, on the bottom there, for your spirits. And you said that you actually used tree bark. Uh, the one above it, you mentioned that you used different kinds of... Um, artifacts. Uh, artifacts. Mm -hmm. Some of them were actual, actual things that were dug up from some of the battlefields that took place during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you choose as you go about engaging in that process to create your work. Because I would never think that you could take an artifact from a Civil War battle and turn it into something as magnificent and as vibrant as what you have. Well, thank you, Kelvin. Um, I'm from Culpeper, Virginia. And I grew up uh, there, and that is um, one of the hubs of, of the whole Civil War. A lot of things happened there. So growing up there, and the high school that I went to was actually located on one of the battlefields, which at the time it wasn't, didn't make any difference to me because I, all I cared about then was like basketball and football. But we played football on the field where people died uh, less than 100 years before. Uh, so as I re when I retired from teaching art in the D.C. public schools, I moved to Virginia. I moved to uh, Colonial Beach, Virginia. So c between Colonial Beach and Culpeper, I would go back and forth, and I actually traveled through uh, several battlefields, Wilderness Battlefield, Chancellorsville Battlefield, and these places uh, haunted me. And the more I read about them and realized that so many people uh, lost their lives in these battles, on these battlefields and their bodies stayed there. They were never interred. Uh, and it sort of, um, uh, it got me the, uh, to thinking really deeply about the spirits of the people who were lost on these battlefields. So then I, um, after I uh, realized that this was the 150th anniversary of the beginning and the end of the Civil War, uh, I wanted to do something to, to actually honor or pay tribute to all these people, 600,000 and more people who died during the Civil War. Many of them, like I said, were anonymous, never even um, buried. Uh, so I uh, would walk through these places and I would sort of feel the spirits of these people. So I wanted to do some art that, uh, that honored these people. And I thought about collecting like the tree bark and the things that grew from the soil where these people fell. Uh, so that's uh, what sort of like, um, uh, motivated me to do these paintings. And the more I did them, I've, been, I've done probably um, maybe 20 or so in this series of these paintings. And, um, and I thought about ways to authenticate them, to make them more real. And I thought about uh, actually getting artifacts. Uh, in many cases, uh, I would go online, I'd go on eBay, and I would bid for uh, collections. People would collect like mini balls and grape shot and all of these things that, uh, that were used to, you know, in, the, in the war. And I would, get, I would collect these things and I would um, uh, classify them as to where they were uh, dug from. And I would have like, things from Brandy Station or things from uh, Chancellorsville. And I, I would uh, sort of categorize these objects. Then as I built my uh, artworks, my, my work is sort of like a, like a collage. I would put all these things down, glue them onto the canvas, then I would add color. Uh, but then uh, the mini balls, in many cases, were uh, they were too thick to put on that, so I would saw them in half. But then I found a way to, uh, to incorporate these things and make them come to life, and make them represent the people who actually use them. Uh, and the whole thrust of my, um, of my series is the spirits of the people. The spirits of the people. I'm curious about that because in July of 2015, mm -hmm. this year, you're going to be showing some of these same works mm -hmm. in Rome, Italy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And 
from the point of view of people understanding more about America and American history and something as divisive as the Civil War, at the same time, because there was so much war that occurred that enabled Italy to become a unified nation, what do you think are some of the touchstones that people who come to see your work there in Rome, Italy, will be able to relate to in terms of not just, again, the power of the work, but also how the fabric of humanity is joined by your work? I was surprised to learn, maybe not surprised, but <clears throat> that um, in Europe, Japan, all over the world, uh, American history is really big. The, the American West, that's, a, that's very, very popular in Germany. Or the Civil War is very popular in, in certain places because uh, I guess maybe when you're too close to it the way I am, it's just like we take it for granted. But people from other places, they are a lot of times and know a lot more about American history than, than I do or than we do. But uh, to me, uh, taking this work to Italy, and I was very um, fortunate to get this exhibit because I knew a person who had collected some of my pieces uh, from being in the, uh, uh, my being in the Artists and Embassies program. And uh, there's this uh, gentleman who is, um, he's, a, he's a, an official in, one of, in, the, uh, in the State Department. He's collected my work. So when he was reassigned to, uh, to be in Rome, he invited me to bring my work there because he had collected a piece of mine called uh, Spirits of Brandy Station. And then uh, he showed that around and then and uh, it was a lot of interest in that. So he asked me if I wanted to do an exhibit uh, at the American Embassy, uh, at the Tri-Mission Gallery, which is that's what the gallery is called, uh, at the American Embassy in Rome. I jumped at the chance, you know. So, uh, uh, so yes, um, I think it's, um, uh, it's very informative and for me it's very important that I bring the spirits of this, of this American Civil War elsewhere. And uh, I think it's, um, uh, I think, I don't know how it'll play, but uh, to me it's, uh, it's just important that I show American history with all of its warts and all of its uh, 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 scars to the world. So you were a teacher in the public school system? Yeah. While you were a teacher, did you try in any way, or did you actually teach art, and did you try in any way, if you weren't an art teacher, fuse this understanding of history and love of history into what you were doing as a teacher? I don't think I did. I mean, it may have, but it wasn't as, as, uh, it wasn't as powerful uh, teaching it, uh, teaching like history as it was personal for me because of the, you know, where I'm from, all the things that I went through, my family history, so forth. It's a very personal thing. And uh, I taught art in the school system, but uh, I also taught photography and I taught uh, ceramics. Those were the subjects that I was, you know, was most comfortable teaching. Uh, painting was a very personal and I had a very difficult time trying to teach painting uh, because it was, like I say, it was like I couldn't tell people to paint the way I wanted them to paint, but I can tell people the way to do a photograph or how to make a piece of pottery or a piece of sculpture. Uh, but yeah, no, I didn't really do as much uh, history uh, teaching as I might have. Yeah. The artist in residence program that you were a part of while overseas. Artists in embassies program. Artists in embassies. Mm -hmm. Is there some tie-in to that with what you're going to be involved with as an ambassador to the African American Museum? Um, I don't think Embassy, so. Embassy, yeah. ambassador, Right. those are <laughs> synonymous, the person who works in an embassy, right, right. so they're, they're different. They are different. Tell they me more different. about than the ambassador position you'll be having, Madame Ambassador, <laughs> to the African American Museum. Yes, the, the, uh, this is a new member of the Smithsonian family, the National, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. That's the entire name of it. And I just got my pin today, just as we were coming Another here. pin in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and um, being an ambassador just means the most important thing is that you're actually giving funds to the organization. So I'm giving funds. It's very important for museums to have donors. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is to have they can't do it all by themselves. I know that as a curator for all these other shows I'm doing, they need help. So I've 
sort of volunteered to be a person to speak up and let people know that this museum is coming. It's coming in, uh, I believe, next year. Next year it's going to be finished being built, and we hope that it will be visited by as many people as possible and that there are opportunities to get involved volunteer opportunities, all sorts of things. But as an ambassador, my job is really to let people know about the museum and to be just like a, a mouthpiece for them. So I'm happy to do that. I've lived in Italy. I speak Italian. I think your work is going to be very successful in Italy. And I say that because it brings me to a thought about art. You've mentioned a lot of African-American artists. You've talked about a lot of black artist groups and art as it represents or emulates the human condition is something that anyone can relate to who's mm -hmm. human. And I want to talk about how you think that you can talk with your young artist as perhaps black or perhaps woman or whoever to be artist and not to necessarily be concerned about or think that, well, this is black art and this might only appeal to someone who is collecting black art or Africana or something that they think is ethnic? You want to go? I think the, the most important thing an artist can do is to be authentic and to be who they are. And for me, my art is personal. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't try to make uh, black art as such but I, I try to make art that means something to me. And in many cases, uh, it has to do with ethnicity. It has to do with, uh, with who I am and where I'm from. But it's not, uh, it's not as important as me expressing what's inside me. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's the way I, I look at it. Mm -hmm. For me, when, for instance, the Pepco show, there was a gentleman, Jonas Gerard, who's from Asheville, North Carolina. Yes. He's from Morocco. He's a Caucasian African American. I love that he wanted to be in the show. We went to his studio, beautiful. He's got two studios, one art studio and one bona fide gallery. Gorgeous stuff. I could feel his spirit. When you see the work, you, you feel it. And that is what I want. That's what I wanted in this show, in the Light of the Ancestors show. And he was drumming for us with the drums he bought from different areas in, in Africa and so forth. So it doesn't matter the color, it matters the spirit. And that's what I wanted, and that's why that show was so successful. We had over 500 people attend the opening night. The security guard had to lock people out. It was so much people in there, but everybody loved it. And really, it was because it wasn't just black art. It was spiritual, it was human art what's from the inside. And I wanted the artists in that show to show, to express the light of their ancestors, whoever their ancestors were, whether they be blood relative or somebody that from the past that they got some kind of inspiration from, I wanted to see that inspiration visually. So not wanting to necessarily to define ourselves in terms of what we can express. What is a mixed media artist? When you call yourself a mixed media artist, and you as well, what does that mean to someone like me uh, who thinks that a mixed media artist might just be someone who has a number of different colors? <laughs> well, it could be that, but uh, for me, um, it's someone who uses a, a vari wide variety of materials and incorporates them uh, into a single piece. It's sort of like marrying these things uh, together uh, and making them work. Well, take this piece right here, for instance. So this is called Spirits of Pope's Creek. And Pope's Creek uh, was a plantation uh, that was owned by George Washington's father, Augustus Washington, and which is near where I live right now. But I, I walk through that area a lot. And when I learned the history of that area, you can't help but to think about all the people who worked there, the slaves who were there all these years, and know that they are, they are there still even though the, the cemeteries, and I've read accounts of where they were buried, but it's not, they're not uh, recognized. There's no place where you can go and say, this is where it was. So I just, to me, I wanted to honor the, the spirits of these uh, lost souls. So I did this piece called Spirits of Pope's Creek. 
And I'm, I'm, this represents like the, the slaves who lived and worked on, on the Washington plantation. And uh, the tree bark I collected throughout that whole area. It's, it's, it's maintained by the Park Service, but there's a beautiful trails that you can walk through and you can walk through the hills and you can see areas uh, where, where the um, ditches and drainage ditches were uh, back in the colonial times. And I know that these places, these, these uh, earthworks were made by African slaves. Uh, but we have no account of them. We don't even know where they were buried. So I'm sort of giving honor to them uh, in this piece here, uh, Spirits of, of uh, Pope's Creek. Even though, I'm fascinated. The slave history and the diaspora of slaves. Mm -hmm. Now you're from Trinidad and Tobago, yes. which clearly being part of that molasses, sugar to rum, or whatever the song may be, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and you having grown up in an area where the Civil War battles were actually fought. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that this art and spirit is informed by black slaves, even though it's not necessarily black art, but that was actually something that forged America's growth, mm -hmm. the use of slaves, black slaves as well as slaves from other countries. Mm -hmm. Growing up in Trinidad and Tobago, how did that inform you as an artist of using this uh, anostic medium? Well, when I when I first started using the encaustic, encaustic. I, yeah, the encaustic, I was finished with my college, everything. It wasn't until my early 30s that I started using it. Before, I liked any medium that was flowing, that would flow. So even now, still, it looks like it's flowing. I get the, I get the wax to act like watercolor or something like that. But for me, growing up in Trinidad, I was only two when I came here. So I don't remember consciously, but I do remember subconsciously. Like, for instance, I love heights. And my mom told me that we, we grew up on a hill. So to this day, I love heights, right? And I, I didn't get what Hubert's background talks about, about the slaves and so forth. So my art isn't so much about that. It's more about what I dream about. And I dream about the cosmos. That's why these shapes and so forth look like they're from outer space or, or aerial views of topographies, it, because somehow I always dream like I'm high up. So it comes forth in my art. That's what you see here. And sometimes galleries look at encaustic as a mixed media, but it really isn't. It's encaustic. This one in the back, I did this in undergrad. I started it in undergrad, and I finished it just this year. And for the first time last year, I actually integrated glass into the encaustic. So I don't have a piece like that here, but that for me is a mixed media where I have more than one media. I've got, I've got the, the wax and I've got glass. Later on, we'll have an opportunity for you to explain some of the different themes. When I saw this initially, it reminded me of Rousseau, the painter who has these mm. images in the desert where a man is sleeping and there's a lion in the mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. But then I'm looking in the background and there's red, black, and green, <laughs> which I might belie my look, but <laughs> red, black, and green was very important. What was that? What was that red, black, and green wave underneath the sun? What was the what was the muse behind that? Of course, that was the African flag colors. There are so many, so many African countries that have those colors still within today. it still today. Like Kenya, yes. I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, this is called the sleep of mankind. Hmm. The sleep of mankind. For me, it's as a Zen student. You mentioned and you told the audience about my living in the Zen temple since 19. And from then till this day, I still do Zen meditation. It's very important for me to know myself. So that's where I come back. Who are you? That's the main question in Zen. Who are you or what are you? So for me, we have so much power inside of us. I feel it all the time. I feel it. And 
when people come around me and I see that they don't know their own power, I know they're asleep to it. That's why I call it, it's like we're majesty, we're royalty. All of us, black, white, red, yellow, we're all royalty, but we're asleep to it. That for me, that's why we have all this bad stuff happening turmoil. in there, a turmoil, mm -hmm. exactly. And Hubert and I are going to be in an exhibit called At War With Ourselves. And mm -hmm. that Where's is, that going to be? That's going to be in the Brentwood Art Exchange in Brentwood, Maryland. Mm -hmm. Just, I think at the end of the month is going to be the opening reception. But um, what is the name of the, the poet who, who wrote that? Nikki Finney. Her Nikki name is Nikki Finney, Finney and she wrote a, a very moving uh, piece uh, called The Blackface Boy. And uh, uh, you know, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how to refer you to, to it, but it's, it's, a, it, it's, a whole, it's a whole program that's dedicated to uh, the artist's reaction to this poem. So maybe you can look it up, and, uh, yeah. but her name is Nikki Finney, F-I-N-N-E-Y. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to just cut to the chase. <laughs> you've talked about how you built synergy between artists among themselves, inspiring one another, how you've given their art more visibility in the corporate world. You've given ideas on how to inspire the emerging artist. How do you inspire the emerging collector? Looking at these art pieces that are mixed media, how does one acquire one of them? How do we go about thinking of the pricing? How do you make the pricing affordable for the new collector who's probably paying for braces, maybe private school, maybe soccer teams? How do you go about pricing? What, what are the ranges and where, other than the art impact or the art rave, where can I buy these and what would, it, what would I be thinking about budgeting to, to make that a reality in my home, like this beautiful piece behind you, which mm -hmm. that's why it looks like I'm staring at you, <laughs> but I'm staring at this wonderful piece of art. Well, before you answer, Hubert, I'd like to say that a part of my job in Art Impact is to make it possible for the collector to be able to acquire this work, but at the same time not devalue the artist's work. So what we do is we have what I would consider payment plans. So the layaway. See, right, layaway. But, but you see, we trust, we trust, I trust when I sit with a collector. The, the, at the last Pepco show, there was a piece that was sold for $6,000. And I sat with that collector and we talked for a good 20 minutes. And the price was a little high for her. I didn't want to devalue the work, but I wanted her to be able to acquire it. And we worked out, I called the artist, I said, is it okay if we come down on a price just a little bit, like maybe 10%, which was fine. But then can she do it in, you know, in, in increments. In increments, installments. But the thing is, it wasn't a layaway plan where you don't get the work until you finish pay for it. You get the work when you give your first deposit and then you keep the work. See, I trust. Some people say that's not a good idea, but in my heart, I know people are good. And if I'm sitting with somebody, I know if they're, if they're going to stiff me or not, and I just won't do business with them. So for me, I can't speak for everybody else, but for me, that's, that's my MO, is to trust. And so if the, if the collector really wants it, and I can tell if somebody really wants something, it will speak to you. Don't buy any artwork just because it's expensive and, oh, it's worth something, it's, it's $10,000, so it must be. No. As a collector, it's like a car. You buy a car. You buy a car because you love it, you know? In terms of building that global audience, and building that bridge to collectors, emerging artists around the globe. Is there a website, is there a place where the folks in Italy can actually look and see in advance your work and begin the process of thinking about how they can actually become a collector, uh, like the gentleman who was with the State Department, mm -hmm. and, and yours as well? Mm -hmm. Sure, you can go to HubertJackson.com and then contact me personally, or you can go to Art Impact USA dot com and uh, work with Carolyn yeah. and she works with me so those are two places that you can uh, see the work that I do and contact me about possibility of uh, purchasing work. When we began this 
hour I said that I was delighted and pleased and now I've been impacted and I'm better. Uh, what I understand about these images, the depth of the story, mm -hmm. the depth of the imagination, and the willingness to help explain the human condition from another viewpoint, uh, this is marvelous. I would suggest anyone in the Washington, D.C. area to come to the Art Rave. I would encourage you to come to DuPont Circle, enjoy a beautiful environment and beautiful art that will impact your life. And it seems like if you want to purchase it, it will not impact your pocketbook. So by all means, be encouraged and be engaged and be willing to be embraced by the human condition as expressed by this work, uh, Ms. Goodrich and Mr. Jackson. For Downbeat TV, we thank you very much and we hope that we actually will be with you again in the near future. Thank you and good night.